I'm here to talk to you about the future of shared mobility. And I'm delighted to be here at the kind invitation of Nico and, and Becky. And before I start, I want to just say, wow. This has been two years in the making, is that right? Well, I want to tell you, it shows. It shows how thoughtful this program has been constructed and how much energy you have put behind this. So congratulations. I, I just have to acknowledge it because it's quite stunning. So this is a question I keep asking myself almost every day now when I wake up in the morning. Do we really just need to rethink everything? Are we at a point where all of the ways we used to think about government and the private sector and our roles as the public, as the consumer, have completely changed? And the answer, I think, is yes. And with that, we need a new mindset. And we really do have to challenge what the future is holding for us. And we've got to be really brave, and we've got to be bold, and we've got to work together in creating equitable policies and transparent partnerships. This is gonna require that we move really rapidly, so events like this and the thought leadership that Nico and his team have brought are absolutely critical. And that's why I'm taking time out of my busy research schedule and teaching schedule to be with you here today. Because I think about this a lot and I've thought about it for two decades. There is so much uncertainty ahead of us, but I think we can do this together if we're really thoughtful. Before I turn our attention to automation, what I wanted to do was review a number of the current studies that are out there on what we call at UC Berkeley ride sourcing. It's a platform that's used to source commercial rides. It's not ride sharing, that's an incidental trip. It's a carpool trip, a van pool trip. Right? also known as transportation network companies. By the way, while I'm getting started, I'm not a big fan of the term ride hail, and that's because TNCs are actually regulated not to hail. So why should we go about calling them ride hail? I've re been really deeply confused about that. So there's been a lot of research out there that's been coming out for a couple of years now, and they've been highlighting a lot of the impacts and so we've taken a lot of time to digest each of these studies, look at their methodological differences, and look at the differences in their impacts. And one of the things I can tell you when you look across the board is there's a lot of range. Some of these studies are highly disaggregated, focusing on a specific location. Some are highly, highly aggregated. It's very, very difficult to tell what's going on at such high levels of aggregation. So we have to be careful when one of these studies comes out, because they're hitting the, the news every day, and we've got to be careful that they're informed by good research and data. Now, a lot of these things show that, that we're adding VMT, vehicle miles travel. A lot of these things show that we're favoring white people in these services and highly educated people in these services. And we're seeing that these services can compete with public transit, with taxis, and also with the private automobile. So we've got a lot of work to do, but I also want to encourage you before you go off to the races with any one of these individual studies to make sure we have the right data before we start crafting public policy. And maybe we need to slow down a bit and think more carefully about the data process and how we're collecting that data, what kind of data we're actually curating, and whether or not that data is, is truly able to answer the questions that we want. And I would argue that purely API scrape data or pure data from a survey is probably not enough to really tell us what's going on. There's no way to validate a lot of that data 
in the absence of a linkage of both platform data and survey-based data. So as we turn to the future, there's been a lot of discussion about where we're going. And there's a lot of forces at play, electrification, IT, shared mobility, and automation. And a lot of people talk about this convergence. And sometimes I find myself at these conferences feeling like everybody's being lulled into a sense of safety and security, that we're gonna converge, and all our problems are gonna get sorted out because of the convergence of these phenomenon. And I'm not convinced that this is gonna take us where we wanna go as a society. I do not think tech is the solution. I think we have to start today, and we've gotta get real about what we really need to do. So I would argue with you that the true magic solution is not the convergence of these technologies, but us caring about one another and society and that we need to get better data, we need to share data, and we need to create the partnerships between the public and private sector that are going to allow us to hit this utopian future. But if we take a purely technological approach, I'm quite convinced we're not gonna get there. So, there's so much discussion about shared automated vehicles, and there's a lot going on. And this particular uh, figure shows a lot of the developments among the OEMs, tech companies, and shared mobility operators. There's acquisitions, there's partnerships, there's personnel going from one location to the next. There's a lot of buzz. At present, we're tracking 50 companies and growing just in the state of California that are registered to test automated vehicles. And fleet-based shared automated vehicle systems are beginning to emerge. We're hearing a lot about them. Waymo is just one of many that we're saying could compete with other modes. Driving, taxis, active modes of transportation, walking, cycling, and public transport. So we've been tracking this activity very, very closely in our research center at Berkeley. And there's a total of 17 active pilots in the SAV space right now. They're all equipped with a steering wheel and a test engineer inside the vehicle for safety in the space of the conventional vehicles. What we see is examples like Waymo, Uber, Newtonomy and Lyft, we've seen a lot of activity in Boston around this. In terms of SAV developments, they're mostly small scale in, in nature. And there are these two categories of both conventional and low speed. So previously I showed you a slide about conventional. Now I'm gonna move us to the low speed shuttles and there's more activity in this particular space. We see Easy Mile, they have a demonstration in uh, the East Bay of California. We see another at the University of Michigan. Oro, which was recently acquired by RideCell, is piloting in Santa Clara. So we see a lot of activity in this space, and again, leaving you with two points. None of these are fully automated vehicle systems yet in terms of advancing to level five using the SAE definitions. And there's a lot of change in this space that's occurring rapidly. So the final part of my talk today and remarks really focus on transportation equity and society and the public good. There's really three important issues here that I think are very, very important for us to consider. One is the lack of smartphone access, data plane access, and even credit card access, which produces a divide. We're also seeing possibly discriminatory practices on these platforms, 
and possibly the displacement of public transit itself. So what I'd argue to you today and throughout this conference is that we need to really elevate this component of the discussion and not get razzle-dazzled just by the tech. We had the pleasure of really going deep dive on the topic of shared mobility and transportation equity, sponsored by the Travel Behavior Office of the Federal Highway Administration over the last couple of years. And what I'm gonna share with you is a lot of the thinking we brought into this project and walked away with. When we thought about these divides, we came across five key areas that we thought were really important for people to think about. Sociodemographic differences are talked about all the time. But are we talking enough about geospatial differences? Those that affect us in urban areas, rural areas, core areas of the urban core, the mindset that people bring to technology, some people aren't as into it as maybe we are. The raw economics of it, of poverty. And then finally, culture. How social, cultural issues, issues of safety and crime in particular areas and particular neighborhoods, how language barriers, all of these things come together to ultimately produce what we call a digital and income divide. So equity challenges come together, and we list them out here. Everything from not having a smartphone to not being able to afford the plan, to being unbanked or underbanked, to simply not being able to afford transportation services, to the lack of service availability in a particular neighborhood, and to individuals with disabilities. We think all of these represent key equity challenges that we have to bring to the forefront of our thinking. This slide just represents about 10 years of our research. And this research has convinced us over the years that a lot of the users of shared mobility tend to be Caucasian, tend to be much more than low income, only about six to 26% in our studies represent individuals of lower income brackets. They're vastly highly educated, four years or more of education. And they are upwardly mobile in terms of their opportunities. So we need to keep all of this in mind. So I wanna move you through a framework that we've developed to help systematically guide us as we start to take all of this apart at ground zero today and how we can work with these factors. We call it the STEPS framework, spatial, temporal, economic, physiological, and social factors. We would argue that all of those need to be taken into consideration as we look to the future of shared mobility, if not a shared automated future. It does matter where you live, it does matter where you work, and there's penalties to be paid if you can't live in the city where you work and you have to be traveling long distances at peak. We think that there's many opportunities for public transit operators as well as uh, the players in the shared mobility industry to correct for this. Temporal issues are absolutely critical. What time of day you're traveling at really does matter and it can create massive issues for people, particularly low income individuals, either trying to get home at night from a job because there's no late night transportation or trying to struggle to get through massive amounts of congestion because they have to live far away from their office or where they work. And there's many opportunities here, as I show, for shared mobility to address that. Economic issues are both direct costs and indirect costs. So not just the cost of an automobile or a toll, but also the indirect costs of not having a smartphone or a credit card. And there's also opportunities for us to subsidize low-income users, to develop multiple payment methods, and to provide access to Wi-Fi at shared mobility hubs. Physiological issues need to be addressed. We need to be providing equitable service, equivalent access to services. So we need to think carefully about how to do that. Maybe it's concierge services. Maybe it's voice-activated mobility app features. And on the social front, there's many things that we can do to eliminate uh, discrimination and profiling on platforms 
We need to do a lot more public outreach to the individuals that we really want using these services in low-income uh, neighborhoods, for example, and we need to make sure that the apps are multilingual. And finally, we do need to think about our, our responsibilities with respect to Title VI and ADA considerations for equivalent service. And by that I mean some transportation modes should, all of the modes should be the same in equivalent neighborhoods, the same hours and frequencies of service and comparable wait times. So I'd like to leave you with three policy questions and I call them the three Ds. Think about the divide when you're developing policies. How do we ensure access to all and equivalent levels of service among all shared mobility providers? And I'd also argue that we need to think about how to provide an even playing field among all the shared mobility providers, public transport, taxis, every form that's out there. Or we're gonna end up with a monopoly or a duopoly situation. Discrimination, how do we prevent this? And how do we focus on protecting those protected classes? And then ultimately displacement, how do we make all shared modes affordable and accessible to low income and the digitally impoverished? That I think is essential. And when we talk about displacement, by the way, I think we've gotta be really careful that we don't fully displace public transportation itself so that at the end of the day, there's no public transport for anybody. This is the report that uh, covers this framework and this thinking, and it's available for you to download. Uh, happy to uh, make it available to you on our website and to provide those links to you here. So just some final concluding thoughts as we think about what kind of world we wanna live in. AVs, if shared, can blur the lines between public and private transportation. SAVs could help achieve efficient and affordable public transportation that improves access to jobs and healthcare and other opportunities like education. There's many opportunities for SAVs to unlock transportation opportunities for first mile, last mile, filling gaps, and helping everybody, the disabled community. I wanna underscore how important it is for cities and sites to understand that they're different. Aggregated studies don't tell you exactly how this is gonna happen in your city and what the impacts are gonna be. Those geospatial and temporal differences are very important to recognize in developing your policies. And SAV policies will need to consider and mitigate for potential adverse impacts. As I've noted, we need to be concerned about equity also, we need to be concerned about sprawl, congestion, safety, and many other things. So in wrapping up, I just wanted to make you aware that there's a lot of resources available to you through our website. We put out a newsly, weekly newsletter. We put out Car Sharing Outlook. We just put out our most recent one about a week and a half ago with the latest numbers. And feel free to make use of this resource. There's a lot of documents out on shared mobility, so you don't have to start from scratch here. And these are more of the reports and publications that you might want to check out. And with that, I'd like to conclude my remarks and thank all of the people that support this research every day. Thank you.